Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Science and Engineering Practice 8. It's on obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. And so it's how scientists and engineers take in information, make sense of it, and then share it with the rest of the world. And that communication is super important because in science, it allows us to share our explanations. And in engineering, it allows us to share our solutions. And a study was done on communication in 2004. This is by Tenniper and King. And they talked to scientists and engineers, and what they found is that they're spending more than half of their working time um, reading, interpreting, and producing text. And so that's wild. Uh, that means that they're spending more than half of their time doing what we would think of as not research, is not doing science, not in the laboratory doing studies. And so the reason that is, is that's how science works. Basically, scientists do research, they gather data, they come up with theories, they test those theories, but when they're done, they publish them in a scientific journal. Other scientists read those, they replicate their results, they build upon them, they approve upon them. And so this whole idea of primary literature, um, scientific journals, and how they drive innovation is very important, and it drives the day of scientists and engineers as well. And so that communication can take several forms. First of all, it can be in the, in, the, uh, in the form of these scientific journals. It can be in books that they publish. Um, they can attend symposiums and they can present their data to other scientists so they can receive information back. Uh, and they can use websites to publish their results and share that with the rest of the world. And so that formal communication is actually publishing something uh, that you want to have uh, your peers review, your peers look at. There's also informal communication that takes place every day, and so it's going to be discussions. Here's a famous picture of uh, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr talking about quantum theory. Email is going to drive a lot of people's day, scientists and engineers, as they get information from other people and they share their own information. But it can be phone calls, it can be blogs, it can be Twitter, it can be all of these forms of informal communication, sharing information, and it's very important, especially technology is driving this now, this um, crowdsourcing of science, everyone working together uh, on solutions, big science we sometimes call that. Now this whole idea of making sense of information is struggle for students, and so students find difficulties, especially in reading science text. And number one reason why is scientific jargon, and so let me read you a little section from this journal. Axonal signals transiently activate the expression of the transcription factor OX6 in Schwann cells that will form myelin and cyclic adenosine monophosphate camp can mimic axonal contact in vitro. And so I actually know what that means, but most of you don't. Uh, and the reason why is that we don't live science day to day. And so that jargon gets in the way. If I were to tell you that in vitro means in a test tube, that would help. Um, if I were to tell you that Schwann cells will wrap around neurons to speed nerve transmission and form a, a fatty substance called myelin, that might help. And so students struggle with scientific reading, and the reason why is that they don't have this foundation. And another reason they struggle is that the intent of science text, and science textbooks for that matter, is that the student can read them or the researcher can read them and they get information out of it. And so it's not a narrative, it's not a story that's fun to read necessarily. It's information that needs to be dis, uh, disseminated in a, in a systematic way. And so that makes it a struggle for our students. And then finally, it's multimodal. In other words, science journals, science textbooks are going to have you know, graphics. They're going to have photographs. They're going to have images. They're going to have data. They're going to have graphs. And so it's difficult as students are reading through that to move back and forth between the text and then between these different modes of, of uh, presenting information. And so what's the goal then as a science teacher? What should be the goal in a science classroom? We want our students to be able to consume information, and then we want them to be able to create and share information of their own. And so if we break that down a little more uh, in detail, we want them to be able to read books. We want them to be able to read text. And we also want them to read primary literature. Primary literature, remember, is going to be literature that's created by scientists and created by engineers. This is those journal articles, for example. We also want them to create information. We want them to communicate their understandings. And then finally, we want them to share that in writing or in, in uh, presentation. And so what's the progression? In other words, how do we teach this from elementary all the way through high school? How do we get students to obtain, to evaluate, communicate this information with others? In other words, how do we have them from day one
throwing darts at the dartboard, and then getting better and better over time? Well, you want to start by talking about explicit instruction. So don't assume that just because you're a science teacher, it means that you don't have to teach reading. You're going to have to teach reading. You're going to have to teach scientific reading. And so you want to get students from the moment they can read looking through not just narrative, but scientific information, scientific journals. Now, you don't have to give them a scientific journal. You can give them articles that are at their own level, but you want them working through the text and giving them strategies. I worked with my students a lot this year on reading strategies, ways that they could look through the material, preview the material, and then go back through it. You also want to give them explicit instruction on how to look at uh, tables or data organized in a table, how to use graphics and diagrams and how to explain it, and then spend a lot of time going through graphs, showing them how to interpret a graph, um, what do the labels mean, what do the axes mean, and asking them questions based on that. Don't just assume that they're going to learn that in your other classes. You have to teach them how to read science in the science classroom. We also want to have them reading primary literature. So we want them reading science, not just narratives of science. And so there's a mistake that we made in science education. That was this idea that hands-on instruction is super important and, and this message out there that you really want students to do hands-on learning. And that's true. You want them doing experimentation in a science classroom. It makes it more exciting. But you don't want to do that in the absence of text you want them to look through science texts as well. And so there's a movement towards what's called adaptive primary literature. If you just give your students primary literature, like a journal article, I, I can tell you this from experience, especially, I mean, even in a high school classroom, if you give them primary literature, they're going to be totally confused. It's at a level that's written for doctoral students, and they're not going to get it. And so there's a movement towards adaptive primary literature. In other words, instead of just writing a book, looking at actual primary literature and then um, writing a narrative. And so this is one of these adaptive, they call it a primary adaptive primary literature. And this is from the University of Alberta. And basically they're going through research. This is an article that was published in Geology uh, and then kind of writing a story that goes with it. Um, then having the students move through that material. That's a lot of work. For me, Scientific American is a, is a scientific magazine. It's not a journal per se, but they have nice scientific articles that are written to disseminate scientific information, but they're more at the level, especially of like a high school student. And so you could look at Science News and be an example of something like that as well. Next, we want them to start communicating their own understanding, and we want them to be able to do that from the time that they can just start reading and writing. And so a science notebook is really important. It allows them to organize their um, data and also their explanations. And so what goes in there? Drawings, numbers, words, data, what they think, their guesses, all of that should go in their science notebook. They should get into this idea that in science, you do science, and you also have to share that science with others. And so this will um, culminate as you move into high school and middle school with actually publishing reports, publishing um, scientific reports based on the data that you have. And so I have my students do this in class. They'll also give formal presentations to the rest of the class, so kind of like a PowerPoint presentation where they take their data and they summarize it and share it with the rest of the class. A big movement now is in, into the area of what are called mini posters, because if you do scientific research, you'll publish your research using a research poster where you have an abstract, your introduction, you talk about the methods that you're using. And so a lot of science teachers will just use a double folder. So you take two folders, you glue them together, and then their students are creating these mini posters where they've got their abstract introduction, their data, diagrams, things like that. And it's a great idea. You can then have them share that. So you can have a poster exhibit where the other students walk around and they can look at that. And so, uh, again, we're gathering information, making sense of the information, sharing it with the rest of the world. And that's a huge part of the daily life of a scientific uh, researcher or an engineer. And it's important that we get our students ready for that. And I hope that was helpful.